What's up, Ryan? I'm so glad to have you on the show. Welcome. Justin, it's been a long time coming, man, and it's really, really good to be here. Well, this is fun. We're, we're kind of doing this full circle because uh, you and I, you know, when we first started working together, uh, we thought it'd be cool as I launched the podcast, since you've had a ton of experience in this space, uh, we thought it'd be really cool to have you interview me for episode one. So for anyone that hasn't listened yet, I know most people have, most people kind of find their way, they like an episode, they go back to the beginning. Uh, but if you haven't, Ryan actually interviewed me about why I was doing a podcast and you know what uh, really, I, what, what was compelling me to want to share all the things that I'm doing uh, you know, with the world. And so it, it's fun now being able to be on the opposite end of the table where I get to interview you. I'll say that first episode, you know, the, the guest was so-so, but the host in that first episode, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a lot yeah. of fun. We'll yeah, yeah. Interview you, ask you about your story and, uh, and kick it off. It was a real honor to be able to do that. And it was a lot of fun. Well, it's cool. Well, of, of all my friends, you're the guy I chose. And I think that it worked out perfectly because you're just a great interviewer and, um, it, you know, th th this is like your wheelhouse. So very cool. And I'm excited to be on the other side now. I've got some warm up reps. So uh, that way I can make sure that I'm interviewing you uh, in a way that, uh, you know, is, is quite similar to the way that you walked me through it. Cool. I'm excited. I'm ready to ready to dive right in and have some fun. Well, it, it's fun kind of even thinking about how we first met. You and I met at a Front Row Dads event. I think yeah. we were, we have a lot of mutual friends. And uh, Hal Elrod had said to me, you've got to meet Ryan. Ryan is awesome on so many levels. Here's all the reasons why. And so uh, I remember introducing myself to you and, and uh, just kind of learning your story. Uh, and, and it was really cool. And it was fun because we're in a season of life where you had uh, maybe, I mean, you had a background, which we can get into in, in investing, working at Goldman Sachs. But uh, you hadn't done a whole lot in the world of private equity and syndicated deals and funds, and you were looking for a little more cash flow and passive income, and you had the resources to be able to do it. And so it was really fun. And then I was kind of looking for something to get into uh, because I had just taken time off. I had spent a year really not doing anything. And I, I remember the conversation. We met at True Food Kitchen, and uh, you kind of wanted to shift a little bit more uh, to my lifestyle. I wanted to shift a little bit more to your lifestyle, and uh, it just really worked out well. Yeah, no, it was perfect. It's um, you know, it's 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 it was just a really uh, symbiotic uh, relationship, and it was just really cool because I obviously learned a ton from you, and you know, I, I shared that in the in the forward to your book. Excellent book, love the book, and uh, it was an honor to be able to share that story. Um, so you've had a huge impact on me and anyone who's read the book will know how, how that impact has played out. Um, but it was also really cool to be able to see sort of someone like yourself and the success that you've had wanting to do some of what we've been able to do in our business, in our life. And so it was a lot of fun and, um, you know, excited to kind of share how um, some folks who are interested in having more of that in their life on uh, this uh, call and this conversation can uh, do the same. Well, it's an honor to have you as a private client, as a mastermind member, as someone who, you know, is just such a student of anything that you do and so hungry for knowledge and information. And then what I love about it is you just take action. And it was amazing to see what you were able to build in passive income and investment opportunities for your family in a short period of time. Uh, and, and that background that you had with Goldman Sachs, I know played in very well. I'd love to talk about that because in your younger years, you had a chance to travel all over the globe. You lived in a bunch of different countries. I mean, you're on this show because one, your lifestyle is incredible. Two, you're truly a lifestyle investor. Uh, three, you helped me build out the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. So it's just so fun coming full circle. Totally. Absolutely. You know, so for me, you know, uh, just to kind of answer that question about how things really got started, uh, I um, am the first in my family to go to college and I grew up very blue collar background. Dad worked nights. My mom cut hair for a living and had the, had the honor and, and really good fortune of being able to attend a, an Ivy League school. And I thought I was going to become a doctor. That was kind of what my plan was. And so I attended Brown and I studied neuroscience 
And my goal was that I was going to become a, a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon. Um, my, my best friend at Brown is a neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic. So he kind of went all the way. But along the way, I kind of realized that it's not really medicine that I wanted to pursue, but I was really fascinated with the, with the mind and, and human psychology. And so one thing sort of led to another and that led me to become fascinated with the psychology of, of, of markets, ca capital markets, and really this, um, you know, so this irrational exuberance and how markets move in different directions and the psychology behind decisions that people make. And so I had an opportunity to, to work for Goldman, uh, worked on Wall Street, um, and I had this other interest along the way as well, which was um, the psychology of language and language acquisition and learning a new language. And so um, in college, I also studied Chinese. I lived in China for a summer and really had this dream of wanting to combine these two things together. I wanted to, uh, to pursue finance and I wanted to pursue a, a career that would take me to China. And I had this amazing opportunity that did just that. And so um, a few years after graduating from school, my wife and I had an opportunity to travel to Asia and um, live all over Asia, um, based in Shanghai, based in Hong Kong, traveling to pretty much every country in Southeast Asia, going as far as India to Korea, to Japan, to, to Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, uh, just, you know, every country that you can, you know, name on the map, we were there and, and really having this amazing lifestyle. And uh, things were going great. And along the way, kind of in my mid twenties, I really sort of had this um, almost like identity crisis. And I said, this is everything that I wanted to achieve in life. Like I've, I've, I'm making great money. I have a great lifestyle. Um, I have a great marriage, being able to travel the world. Um, is this it? And I kind of had like this quarter life crisis. And it was then where I started to think about, well, the thing that I really want to do is I want to create something. I want to build something. I want to, I want to build and create my own business, but I don't really know quite what that is. And uh, this was around 2007 uh, when I uh, came across a, a book that I know that you're familiar with as well, which is the four hour work week. And uh, I remember we did a trip to Kota Kanabalu, Malaysia, and um, I listened to the audiobook version of four hour work week when we we're on that trip um, at the Shangri-La. And I was just completely blown away. It was this new paradigm that I hadn't even really considered as a possibility. And so it kind of led me down this path of wanting to pursue building a digital business, a digital business that would allow us to travel the world, live anywhere that we want, create an amazing lifestyle for ourselves and go from there. Well, fast forward to 2008. 2008 happens. My wife is uh, based in Hong Kong. She's pursuing a PhD at Hong Kong University. I'm based in Shanghai with this crazy bi-country marriage where we're flying to see each other every single weekend on an airplane. I'm getting burnt out. I have this dream to start my business. And I literally walk into my office one day and the company I was working for um, at the time was, was AIG, American International Group. And the headline for the Wall Street Journal Asia edition said AIG to file for bankruptcy. And, and I, I remember seeing that and I called up Tylene and I said, honey, go to WSJ.com, check it out. And she says, what does it mean? And I said, honestly, I don't know. But it was at that moment in time that I realized this was that sign for the, from the universe that I was waiting for, that now is the time to do that thing. So literally that day, I draft up a resignation letter, type it up, sign it, walk it into my boss's office, the president of uh, AIG Asia. And uh, I said, you're not going to love what I'm about to give you. Um, but I have to do this and I have to do this now. And I turned in my resignation. 14 days later, I donated everything that I owned up until that point, everything that I'd accumulated in the last 10 years of my life, except for a suitcase, moved in to my wife's student housing at Hong Kong University, a tiny little 400 square foot apartment. We basically started over and that's where we started our first business. And uh, that business is now you know, grown into a, a five-time Inc. 5000 company. And we've built a software technology platform that's you know, used by 30 million people around the world and you know, a lot of cool twists and turns, mistakes and bumps and bruises along the way. But that was kind of how everything got started and uh, how things began in our sort of early humble beginnings. Well, I love this pivot. I mean, these are not small pivots. You <laughs> were going to be a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon. Uh, then you pivot and you're in the financial space. Then you pivot again, you know, to the smallest place you've probably ever lived and you start your own company uh, mm -hmm. and you begin writing and you begin building something from scratch. You had no skill set here. You're brand new. You've had a career, an education and a career in a completely different path. Right. And I just love the resolve and the you know, just, just the, the grit to get it done, but also this ability to say, Hey, 
let me step because you're, you're a guy that's very detail oriented. You want to know all the numbers, make sure everything makes sense before you move forward. So to me, I feel like there are a lot of entrepreneurs when they go out on their own and it's like, yeah, but they're, they're kind of risky. I could see them doing it. I think mm -hmm. in your case, it's a big step, a big leap because there was so much unknown and that had to totally violate kind of some of the rules and boundaries that maybe you operated from. Am I, am I sensing anything correctly there? Yeah, I mean, we know each other pretty well and uh, you're absolutely right. I think I'm probably one of the most risk averse entrepreneurs that you'll probably ever meet. Um, and it's really why we pursued the strategy that we pursued and what's evolved into the methodology and the technology that we now teach and deliver, uh, which is very much about eliminating the guesswork out of decisions that you make in your business and in your marketing and in your products and in your process that you're building in your company. And, uh, you know, so for me, it was very much like that. Um, you know, my, my dad worked a union job and work nights and it was drilled into my mind as a young kid even into adulthood that you don't take risks like the the paradigm for success is you get a good job with a good company and you work there and you stay there for life and so for me i had to unlearn a lot of that kind of thinking around things um and one of the things i realized along the way and a lot of my friends have you know who have gone on to do very very Big things, you know, they're all you know successful attorneys and doctors, and 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 work in finance. And the friends of mine who have kind of asked for my advice, the thing that constantly comes up is that I find that people are afraid to give up good in order to go after great. And and I think that's the biggest challenge. It's like most of the people I talk to, they're not living in a cardboard box on the side of the road. Like they've got a good career, they've got a good life, they've got a nice house, they've got nice things. They send their kids to nice schools, and it's very scary to think about giving that up or risking that in order to go after great. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the psychology around that and, and sort of how to, I've spent a lot of time studying the psychology of fear and how to hack that fear response in your brain and certain practical tactical techniques that you can actually employ to overcome that inertia and overcome that fear. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's taken work to your point to get to this point. Um, but the good news is there are strategies that anyone can use who's in that situation saying like, I'm, I want to become a full-time lifestyle investor, but I'm afraid to give up my career and my job. Like, how do I actually do that? Like, how do I take that tiny little baby step that moves in that direction? So, um, and what's interesting about that is as we talk about kind of the, the topic that we'll be focusing on here today, there are a lot of interesting parallels between your understanding your own psychology and how you can apply that when you build your marketing and sales funnel that will drive the engine of your business. Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and I think for most people, there's this fear of the unknown that holds them back. You know, there's, I think people really are handcuffed to security and safety just as much as they're handcuffed in most instances to lifestyle and, you know, being accustomed to a certain amount of income and, and really having a certain amount of expenses that are covered by that income. So a drastic change is really hard for most people to step into the unknown, to walk away from a good thing. Uh, most people think the good thing is so good, but don't realize the great thing is right around the corner and it's not that far off. Hmm. So I love your story also, though, because you're not just um, you're not just kind of playing it safe and you're not just, uh, you know, building something that is taking all your time and energy. I know you've been in a season and, and building it where that happened, but so much of what you're doing now is lifestyle. There's so many cool trips that we've talked about you guys taking and uh, you know, some of the cool things of traveling around the world recently, both of our families just, um, uh, proceeded with the gold Portuguese or, you know, Portugal's golden visa program, uh, which is really cool to get second citizenship in a European country with access to the entire Shenzhen, you know, region and the, you know, whole Eurozone. And so I'd be curious to hear some of the cool stuff that you and your family have planned uh, and then I'd love to get into some of the specifics of your business and what you do. Yeah, for sure. You know, so, you know, for me, you know, as a, um, as a dad, as a husband, 
you know, for me, I take a look at the roles that I play and, and that really for me is number one. Yes, I identify as a CEO. Yes, I identify as an investor, but for me kind of, you know, job number one is, is, is dad and, and husband. And, you know, my, my kids are at an age right now where I can, I can see the end of the time that I have with them at home. And so when we've made decisions in terms of how we run our business and the investments that we make, it has all been in service of creating a lifestyle for our family. So for example, on the business side, we built a business that is a 100% remote company. So we have about 75 employees spread around the world, but I work from home. We don't have a physical office. Um, I never wanted to have a commute. I had a long commute when I lived in Manhattan for a story for another day, I actually commuted to Philadelphia for about nine months, which is a three hour commute each way each day. So six wow. hours commuting. And I had that experience and I said, all right, I'm never going to have a commute for the rest of my life. Uh, so um, when we started our business, I wanted a model that would allow us to work from home and li literally work from anywhere. So that's allowed us to do things like homeschool our kids. We homeschool our kids. They're literally in the other room right now. I'm not sure what they're doing, but uh, they're doing something productive and um, be able to do things like travel and take time to um, you know, live life, um, not just push off you know, retirement to someday maybe, but be able to kind of create an amazing lifestyle for ourselves. Um, and the same thing on the investment front is um, investments that are not going to tie us to have a, you know, a, a general partner role that's going to require us to be anchored to a specific location, but be able to invest as an LP in deals that allow us to be totally hands off and collect cash flow from those deals, but not have to have mind share or be laying awake at night, stressed out about, you know, some project that we have to get our hands dirty with. So we've made a lot of decisions there, but just to kind of paint a picture for, you know, the, the, the life plan, the adventure uh, that uh, we want to take our boys on um, over the next few years. There's three phases to it. I know you've heard this story, but um, maybe this will give you some ideas for anyone listening to this or some inspiration or maybe motivation for something that you might be able to create for your family. Um, so three phases to this three-part adventure. Um, and they coincide with my, my oldest son, my oldest child, um, probably the time he'll be at home before he goes off and you know into adulthood and whatever that next step and phase of his life is. Um, so phase one is um, we've uh, taken possession of a, an extreme overlanding expedition vehicle that can go anywhere in the world. And we're gonna be taking a, an extended, basically transcontinental trip um, across North America, potentially into South America, and basically spending a lot of time in the natural world and going places where most people can't go, driving up to Alaska, the Arctic Circle, possibly as far south as the so Southern Hemisphere and the tip of South America. That's sort of phase one of our adventure. Um, phase two, in the meantime, we've been pursuing second citizenship in EU, in Europe, via Portugal, uh, alongside Justin, and uh, with the goal of spending at least a year living in Europe and being able to spend time traveling to all the you know, historic places and have a real life history lesson that's not just read in a book, but is spent uh, sort of pursuing that. And then phase three of the adventure is uh, to uh, take a trans uh, a global um, expedition in a, in a global expedition yacht um, to be able to circumnavigate the globe. And we've already started to kind of plan out what that trip is and be able to visit places around the world, countries around the world that you know many people never have the opportunity to do so. Um, and we want to do it as a family. Um, we want to do it in a way that there really truly is an adventure of a lifetime. And so when I think about, you know, what's important and priorities for me, it is about experience. It is about lifestyle. And, you know, the, the, the call to adventure is strong for me. And for anyone listening to this right now, what I'd say is the decisions that you make today will set you up for the moves that you want to make tomorrow. And there's no move that you can make that's too small to, you know, inch by inch, it's just, it's a cinch, right? As the, the, the children's book says. So all you need to do is take that first step in the direction of what you want to pursue, have that grand, bold vision, and truly almost anything is possible. So that's just a little bit of insight into our life, what motivates me and kind of why we do what we do. And, um, you know, Justin, why I'm so grateful for you, because the work that you do has allowed us to create a uh, level of passive income cash flow that we can at any time decide to pursue that 100%. So um, yeah, it's just um, your, your, what you do and what you teach is um, it works. And uh, you know, what we've been able to do is a, I guess a living testament to, um, to that very thing. Well, thanks for the kind words. And I just am so inspired by 
your travel plans and all the cool stuff you're doing, the really amazing experiences that your your two awesome boys are going to have. You know, it's it's fun getting to know them. We went on a camping trip uh, with our kids, and the, our kids just hit it off, and it was so much fun. And now they can't wait to hang. And I I so knowing them, I can't wait to see the awe in their eyes as they get to experience all that life has to offer. And I just think it's so cool that you're able to do that, that you're able to carve out that space. So thank you for sharing that. It's one of the coolest things that any of my friends are doing, any of the, the cool plans that exist out there. I mean, this is at the top of the list. And so I'm excited to meet you up on uh, different portions of this trip. So awesome. cool. Well, you have really made a career um, you know, of being an entrepreneur, of being an innovator, you wrote a book called the ask or ask, um, which is based around the ask method. And it became a, a bestseller on every list, uh, even the, the hardest ones, the New York times. And, uh, you have this methodology that has worked. And I know you've since written several other books, but, I think it all kind of falls under the banner of your most fundamental uh, idea, which is this whole quiz. Like, how do we get information from our target market, right? Like, how do we ask questions that give us the answers that we're looking for? Because we may not know them, but the people that we want to be in business with or partnership with do, and we can solicit them for that information. And I'd love to hear... Uh, you talk about this because um, one of the things I'm most excited about is the fact that um, I recently purchased uh, with you uh, the, you know, basically your quiz funnel. We're going to build one out, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for lifestyle investor and for, um, you know, one of the other brands that, that, uh, that I, you know, ha have started. And I'm just excited about, uh, everything that is going to kind of go into that and the creative genius there. And, and this wasn't cheap. I mean, this is tens of thousands of dollars that I spent for your genius and your expertise, because you are literally the master. You're the, you're the Jedi of this space and there is no one else in the world doing what you're doing. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about quiz funnels, the importance of them. And I'd love for my audience just to know why I see so much value in it. Mm, yeah, it's a great question. And so, um, you know, speaking of pivots, it's a bit of a pivot from the first part of this conversation, um, but but I'll kind of tie it back to sort of how we got to where we are here today. So I'll talk about this just in a sort of personally how we got to where we are here today. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of globally on a macro level, why this idea of a quiz funnel is so relevant. It's so topical. It's so right here, right now, and so important for anybody who is looking to generate leads and clients online to be using the strategy in your business. So if we go back in time to 2008, when I had just quit my job and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, I had come across the work of a uh, social psychologist by the name of Dr. Glenn Livingston. And uh, he was the person I considered to be my first mentor as an entrepreneur. And um, the approach that he had developed was very deep sort of analytical psychological approach. He's somebody who comes from a family of 17 psychologists, 17 PhDs in his family. So just completely obsessed with the mind. He's an absolute genius. And I studied underneath him and I became really his protege. He wrote the forward to my book and learned that um, big companies, Fortune 10, Fortune 50 companies were using this very sort of analytical, very detailed psychological process to understand the different segments of their market and market to them in different ways. So companies like Procter & Gamble, companies like AT&T, Novartis, big companies that we're, we're all familiar with. And um, what I'd found is that this approach was something that you could apply as an entrepreneur, that you could take it down, you could take the essence of it and apply it to any small business. And so after leaving my job in finance, I started a, a business and uh, we grew that business from nothing to about $25,000 a month in a little over a year. Um, then to over $100,000 a month. And because I wasn't sure if it was a fluke or not, and by the way, this was, this was in a totally random, obscure market. It was in the orchid care market. So like orchids is in the flowers. Um, because I wasn't sure if it was a, it was a fluke, uh, we repeated that process 23 times, 23 different markets. And every single step along the way, we started refining this process of using the power of self-discovery, using the power of asking questions when someone lands on your website in order to be able to customize the messaging, the marketing, the copy, the angles that you put in front of people based on their 
answers to this diagnostic, to this assessment, to this quiz. Um, along the way, a few big companies kind of got wind of what it is that we were doing, and uh, we partnered with them to build quiz funnels. And a few notable ones that I'll just share, just so you get a sense for like the scope of opportunity, and then we're going to dial it down to um, why why now, why right here, right now, and, and how to begin actually applying this in your business. Um, a tiny little company in the golf space um, heard a little bit about what we were doing and reached out and asked if, if we could partner to create a quiz funnel in the golf market. And we did that. Um, and at our peak, we were generating about 10,000 leads a day. So 10,000 golfers taking one of our quiz funnels every single day. And um, eventually we built this massive audience of about um, uh, almost 10 million golfers, this incredible database and all the data around it. We were selling millions of dollars a year in product behind it. And we had an unsolicited offer from uh, the Golf Channel in partnership with NBC to buy the company for over $100 million, all on the back of this strategy. A little bit later, um, had a similar experience with a comp company in the business funding space where we created this quiz funnel to help identify what business loan is right for you. And we refined it, we built it, we grew that over 20,000 loans through this platform. We rebranded it as Loan Builder and got purchased by PayPal for $186 million. And PayPal still uses this brand to its day. It's their Loan Builder product. And so it was along the way that I kind of realized that there was something big here, that there was something really powerful. And um, on the back of, you know, a few small exits, I, you know, didn't, I didn't get the $186 million. I got a small, very small portion. Um, but um, on the success of that, I realized that there was something here. So we, we built a, a training company and a software company to kind of extend this to the masses. So when you think about this opportunity of what this means, I first want to set the stage by talking a little bit about what a quiz funnel is. And then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, why this is such a powerful strategy. So first and foremost, a quiz funnel in the way that we're defining it right now is not one of those time-wasting quizzes that you've probably seen and taken online. Like this is not one of those like what Harry Potter character is your dog type quiz. Like that's not what we're talking about at all. Like those are great. Those are fun. Those are entertaining. Um, but those are not going to convert clicks into clients. That's just an entertainment tool. What we're talking about instead is when someone lands on your website, you begin by asking a series of questions to just like a doctor, attract, diagnose, and prescribe. You're diagnosing a person's situation so you can prescribe the best next step. And there are a few kind of big reasons why this is so important, so valuable. And I'll talk about those reasons. But first, Justin, I want to give you a chance to get a word in here and anything that you might want to say um, relative to that, kind of setting the stage for this conversation for anybody who might be interested in growing your business, getting more clients, getting more leads through the internet, and how you can apply this strategy. Yeah, you know, when I started doing my research on this, um, and keep in mind, we had known each other for a while, and I still wasn't sure, you know, if I should do this. And I remember asking you, and, and you're like, yeah, it's a no brainer. Let me give you all the reasons why, like, you'd be crazy not to think about doing this for, you know, lifestyle investor. And, uh, and so I just thought it was fascinating that, you know, my mind, I feel like uh, there are so many things where I'm ahead of the curve on in the world of investing or networking or negotiating or relationships. But this is one I'm just so far behind the curve on that I didn't even see the value prop until it was laid out so nicely by you in front of me. And so uh, once I understood it, it was a no brainer. It was like, well, of course, you know, it, and from a pricing standpoint, like, it's a no-brainer, even as expensive as it is, uh, and and so I, I'm just excited to you know kind of work hand in hand on this. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And you know, so before we kind of dive in and talk about why quizzes, this is a strategy that you can use no matter what type of market you're in, whether you're in a B two C market, a B two B market. It's a strategy that you can use no matter what your price point is. If you sell a you know fifty thousand dollar program or a fifty dollar product a physical product, a digital product, whether you sell a service, if you're a financial planner and you use the internet to get leads for your financial planning business, if you are an insurance broker, if you have a local brick and mortar business, if you have an online only business, it doesn't matter what your culture or language is. We have successful quiz funnels in over 63 different countries. We have over 12,000 quiz funnels built on our platform in something like over 47 different languages. So this transcends culture, it transcends language. And the reason for that is because you're tapping into these certain fundamental 
desires that are universal in our human nature. And the first one is tapping into this power of self-discovery. See, when you have a quiz funnel that's well-designed, you're tapping into the self-discovery element where people, no matter what market they're in, no matter what culture or language they speak, the thing that's universal is that people want to know more about themselves. We are all our favorite subjects. If you ask anybody, it doesn't matter what you sell. The thing that people care more about than anything else is me, myself, and I. So when you can take people through this journey where you're asking a series of questions and you can tell them something about themselves that they don't yet know, you can offer this element of self-discovery, it's an incredible, compelling promise. And I'll just think about your own physiology when I walk you through two different scenarios. So just imagine for a moment, you are um, browsing on social media and you come across a little post on social media that gets your attention. And the post is something to the following. It says, click the link below to get my free ebook, okay? Now think about another alternative scenario. Same thing, social media, post that you see. Click the link below to find out your personal results. Do you feel how it's so much more personal, how it's so much more intriguing, so much more curiosity inducing because you're speaking to the individual instead of selling to everybody in a one size fits all way? So that's the premise, that's the paradigm here. And I'll talk about a bunch of examples to bring this to life. But before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about why quiz funnels are so valuable, so important. The first big reason is on the back of this strategy, you can get incredibly cheap leads, incredibly cheap traffic. And the reason for that is there are a few forces at play. Number one is that power of self-discovery is a very compelling promise. So oftentimes you'll see a much better conversion rate, a much better uptake rate when you switch from, you know, get my free white paper to find out your results. That's number one. But number two, a well-designed quiz funnel is something that people will share. People will take it, get their results, get value from that experience, and they'll share it with their colleagues. They'll share it with their friends. And when that happens, your quiz funnel effectively has gone viral. And all of that additional traffic that you get via referral is free. So that drives down your advertising costs. The third force at play is when you advertise on social media, when you advertise on places like Facebook and Google and YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn and all the different platforms that exist online and drive traffic to your quiz funnel, every single one of those platforms is looking to improve user experience. And one of the ways they measure user experience is the level of engagement with content. So if you have a piece of content, a post on LinkedIn or a post on Facebook, for example, and people are commenting on it, they're hitting the share button, they're hitting the like button, well, the Facebooks of the world will say, let's expose this to more people. Let's drive down the advertising cost, what we call in the industry, the CPM, the cost per thousand impressions. And so what ends up happening with a quiz is that people in the comment thread will post their results. I got OBPF. What's your result? They'll hit the share button. They'll say, hey, Janet, have you taken this assessment? I think it's really, really good. And the Facebooks of the world notice this and they drive down your advertising cost. So the net effect is that you can often cut your cost per lead by anywhere from 30 to 90% or more. And wow. that's not, a, not speaking that. If you're getting leads at $5 a lead, you can conceivably drive down your cost per lead to less than a dollar per lead simply, simply by switching to the strategy. And I could share case study after case study after case study of businesses who've been able to do that. Now that's the first thing, Justin, right? But whenever... I talk about cheap leads, people tend to kind of have this reaction, well, yeah, but how do those leads convert? And that's the second part of the equation. This is one of these strategies where you can truly have your cake and eat it too. Because when you are driving people through a quiz funnel, after the quiz and the response and the results, you are able to customize the copy, the creative, the content, the message that you put in front of someone based on their quiz answers. And when you do that, you can often double or even triple your sales conversion rate on the backside. So instead of selling to everybody in a one size fits all way, like for example, just, just pick a business. Like if you are a financial planner, as an example, and you take people, and we have a lot of financial planners, by the way, who use the strategy and who, and you'd say you're asking a series of questions, knowing about a person's situation will allow you to customize perhaps the client case study that you put in front of them. I mean, think even your business, right? Imagine, for example, if you have, just take two avatars, just take two avatars, someone who is a business owner and is looking to free up their time by generating passive income via cash flow investments. Avatar number one. Avatar number two, person who is working a day job, who is looking to supplement their income and eventually exit the rat race by 
employing passive income cash flow investing strategies. Now imagine if we just ask one question to understand which of those two buckets someone falls into. Can you think about how you would change your marketing strategy, change the case studies that you talk about, the people in your mastermind that you would say, hey, you're just like so-and-so and how much more relevant it's going to be to them where they say, oh my gosh, if he's been able to have success or she's been able to have success, maybe I can have success too. So that's just a very simple example of how this begins to scratch the surface of the power of the strategy. So cheap leads, high conversion. And there's a third one that I'll uh, talk about in a moment. But again, I want to give you a chance to pop in and say anything that's on your mind. Well, it's just incredible because the, you know, when you have that type of information, it is a different message. I think, you know, foundationally, a company likely has one message that, you know, maybe they want to give. But from a marketing standpoint, you have to appeal to who your target market is and, and your target market is likely in a bunch of different industries or has a bunch of different likes or a bunch of different passions. And so, yeah, I think if you can cater that marketing, um, you know, and even the questions you ask for, for more clarity, I just think it's, it's fantastic. You know, I've heard it said before and, and I'm not an online marketer, this is not my world, but you know, I've heard the, that your list is like the most valuable asset that you have, that it's that important. And um, I think that this method is powerful in the fact that not only do you get to learn what really your target market needs to hear, wants to hear, like what's important to them, but you're also adding to that list uh, and I've seen this myself, you know, in my own business with, with the lifestyle investor. And it's, it's just fascinating watching it kind of take shape and, and organically grow. Yeah. You know, the list is arguably the most valuable asset in any business. In other words, your audience, your customer list, your database. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the third big reason, not only cheap leads, not only incredibly high conversion, but it all comes down to one four letter word. And that word is data. Now, I want to do kind of a quick sort of brief macro uh, overview of where the world has come to in the world of digital marketing, but the world at a grander, larger scale. So we're entering what many people describe as this new era of the internet, what people are describing as Web 3.0. Now, when people think about Web 3.0, a lot of times what it evokes in their mind is, you know, the metaverse walking around with virtual reality, reality goggles, um, things like cryptocurrency and blockchain, all of which are elements of Web 3.0, but they're arguably not the most relevant and most important based on where we are right now. So how do we get to Web 3.0? How do we get to where we are? Well, to understand 3.0, you have to understand Web 2.0 and 1.0. And then we're going to circle back to how this is relevant to our conversation right now and your business. If you have a business right now and you advertise or you generate leads and customers online. So Web 1.0 was, for the first time ever, we entered into this world where we're experiencing the democratization of information in a way that we've never had before, right? Before Web 1.0, if you wanted to study something, you had to either go to the library or go to a university in order to learn about it. But with Web 1.0, anybody could create any website on any topic in the world. So you have this mass proliferation of information shared in all sorts of different ways. People have their own websites. They maintained their own servers. They had all this control to be able to disseminate whatever information that they wanted. But then along the way, it became a little bit of work. Like it's a lot of work to have your own website and maintain your servers. So we have these big data sources that came up that said, hey, instead of creating a website, why don't you just set up a Facebook page? Or you don't need a website, you can just post on Twitter. So you have the Twitters, the Facebooks, the LinkedIns, the YouTubes of the world that said, instead of having to do all this work, we can consolidate all that information. That created a mass consolidation of data in the hands of just a few large big tech companies, companies like Facebook and Apple and Microsoft and Google. And so we entered into this era where it's sort of the place that we've been for a very long period of time for the last decade, where you could just go to a company like Facebook and you could say, look, Facebook, I have this product that I want to sell. Who should I show this to? And Facebook with the vast amounts of data, third party data that it has access to, has been able to just point you in the right direction and say, oh, these people would be the perfect prospects for your business. Now, in 2021, that all came to a screeching halt with a seminal event when Apple released the iOS 14 browser and operating system. And in that move, Apple made the decision to quite literally cut off the umbilical cord, connecting its data 
to Facebook and no longer revealing and sharing that data. Now, it did so in the interest of data privacy, but really in response to what's happening at a much more macro level, which is this general feeling of distrust. The default emotion in the world by pretty much any measure that you study, if you've studied this, is an emotion of distrust. People enter into conversations and experiences online feeling distrust as the default state. And so it's not just distrust with big tech and big data, it's distrust in all institutions, right? It's government distrust, it's financial institution distrust, which is where blockchain and cryptocurrency has really emerged from. Um, but it's also online distrust, big tech. And so Apple in response to that said, we're no longer sharing this information. And when they did so, they effectively cut Facebook off at the knees. And what it means is Facebook can no longer accurately recommend and drive your product to the right visitors, the right potential customers. It no longer has that ability because Facebook can only now see the data that it has access to on its own platform. It no longer has access to the, the browsing history that you might've displayed. Like for example, the fact that you were on a camping website and you're shopping for backpacks and you're shopping for flights. Hey, therefore probably you're gonna be in the market for you know, camping supplies and you know, going on a vacation. No, Facebook no longer has that information. And a few weeks ago, Google announced that they're following suit, eliminating cookies as we've known it, browser side cookies. And so what does that mean? For anybody who drives business online, what it means is we've moved from a third party data paradigm where you can rely on third-party data to now what's known as a zero-party paradigm. Now, zero-party data, first-party data, by the way, just to set some definitions, is when someone lands on your website, tracking user behavior in the background. What did this person click on? What did they read? What did they watch? It's all in the background type stuff. Zero-party data is information that your website visitors explicitly and voluntarily share with you i.e. you ask them questions on your website and you provide the, and they provide the answers to those questions. And then you use that information to inform what to sell, what to direct people to. The third party paradigm is done. That era of online advertising is over. And if you've been relying on that paradigm and you're continuing to rely on that paradigm as we move into this new era, you're setting your business up to fail. You must have a zero party data strategy, a strategy when someone lands on your website where you can ask questions. And then the beautiful thing is, even though Apple has cut the umbilical cord to Facebook, with your own zero party strategy, you can plug that data back in. So that was the, the first point that you wanted to make sure that you covered. Um, but I, it seemed like there was a, like a three pronged approach. Is that right? Yeah. So the big takeaway is there are three big reasons why this strategy is so effective and so important and relevant right now. It's number one, incredibly cheap leads. Number two, incredibly high conversion of those leads. And number three, incredibly valuable data. And the good news is this is one of these strategies that you can feel really good about implementing because it not only helps you better sell, but it also ultimately helps you better serve your market. You're pouring goodwill into the market. It's one of these strategies that when your head hits the pillow at night, you can feel really good about the way you're communicating with people online because you're truly adding value. You are asking questions in the same way that you would if you're interacting with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Like for example, Justin, imagine for a moment if I came up to you or someone came up to you that you'd never met before and said, hey, Justin, I've, I've I'm, I'm, I've read your book. I've listened to your podcast. I love what you do. And you say, you know, Justin, what should I invest in next? Now, it would be absurd for you to just respond to that person and say, oh, I know exactly what you should invest in. How would you respond? If you're like most people, you would say, well, I, I don't know, but do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Now, imagine that conversation, right? You might ask, like, for example, tell me a little bit about your investment goals. Like, what's your experience level? You know, what are you trying to get to? Are you more interested in cash flow or capital appreciation? What's your risk tolerance? Tell me a little bit about your portfolio right now. And with that information that you ask, you would be able to recommend a good next step for that person. Now, the only problem is there's only one Justin Donald and you can only have one of those conversations at a time. But imagine for a moment, if your website was able to have hundreds 
or thousands of those conversations on autopilot every single week, 365 days a year, 25, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. That's what this strategy allows you to do. It's a conversational funnel that allows you to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation you'd otherwise have with an individual and have that in a leveraged way, thousands of people at a time. Well, that is incredibly valuable. I, I mean, I can, I can see that because it's the same thing I talk about with, with uh, earning you know, money in, and you know, kind of having money work while you're sleeping, right? It's this whole idea that it's not involving you, it's not involving your time, it scales much beyond what you can actually do with your time. And so it's the same thing here with, with traffic and conversion. And I just have to say, you know, with, with some of the other things that you shared, it, it's so eye-opening um, kind of what's happening, the shift that's taking place. Um, I totally feel and understand, and even, you know, for me personally, have distrust of a lot of these organizations and institutions because I don't feel like they have um, our best interests in mind. I feel like they have their best interests in mind. And I think that it is, I mean, that, that's been proven in many instances, especially with the banking industry and, you know, all the fouls that you see there with like abusing customer information and, and data. And so I love that Apple's making this move that Google is following in suit. But at the same time, I think um, they're, you know, they still capture data. They still use that data. They're just not sharing that data with everyone else. And so Precisely. I think it's important to recognize that, that it, it, the data is still being captured and gathered. Um, and so I, I do think it's important that people recognize that that is the case and that's what's happening. But there is the danger of, what used to work no longer works. What, you know, whatever worked on web two is not going to work on web three. It's just like when you scale a business, you know, when you're at a uh, million dollars of revenue, the systems that you have in place there generally aren't going to work at 10 million revenue, at 50 million revenue. And it's like a whole brand new company at 100 million revenue, right? And so I think you just have to adopt with the times or adapt Absolutely. with the times, adopt, you know, the new technology, whatever is working, but not get lost in the past thinking that whatever you did is going to continue to work. And a lot of people had a rude awakening during COVID where they realized what they did for, you know, the last 20 years of their business that worked didn't work for those two years. And they've had to go back to the drawing board and figure out a new strategy. And in some cases, the businesses you don't figure it out in time and they die, but other ones you do figure it out. They grow, they become stronger, they become better, or there's just a new business opportunity. Absolutely. You know, and these changes can happen faster than you might expect. These are types of things, just like when COVID hit and, you know, the, the grocery store shelves were completely empty in a matter of days, it can happen that fast. And so for anyone listening to this right now, if you felt the pressure, if you felt maybe your advertising costs have gone up, Maybe the effectiveness of your advertising has not been what it was in years past. Some of the forces that we're talking about right now represent the reason behind it, why that's happening. So the question is, what are the companies that are winning in this new era? What are they doing differently? And they're using what we're talking about right now. And I'll just share like a few examples of just different businesses that are absolutely, you know, crushing it using the strategy. So um, I think of like in an, and I'll pick a variety of different businesses just to kind of set the stage. Um, I think of um, a company called Snack Nation that built a quiz funnel to figure out what type of healthy box of snacks you should receive at your doorstep. So imagine getting a healthy box of snacks curated for you. Built their business on the back of a quiz funnel, multi-time Inc. 500 company, grew from nothing to $24 million a year on the back of this strategy. Um, I think of smaller businesses. I think of, uh, for example, uh, Deirdre Fay, who's a therapist, a local therapist who is struggling to get new patients for her practice, created a what's your relationship type quiz funnel and is now has a wait list of patients for her local practice. Um, I think about people like Morgan Gist McDonald. She has a very small publishing business, a boutique publishing business. She created a quiz funnel. What publishing path is right for you? If you've ever thought about publishing a book, like just in the, some of the conversations you and I have had, think about all the decisions you have to make. Do you self-publish? Do you go with a traditional publisher, a vanity press? Do you launch a soft cover, hard cover, ebook only? Should you do an audiobook? Should you record your audiobook? Should you have a, a professional voiceover artist? There's so many decisions around the right path to publish your book. So she created a publishing path quiz using our methodology, our technology, and she sells a 50 
fifteen to thirty thousand dollar publishing package directly on the back of this quiz. She was working for Starbucks as a barista, as a mom with four kids when she started this process. Now she has a multi-million dollar business all on the back of this strategy. So whether you're looking to get clients online, whether you sell a, uh, a, a, a physical product, um, whether you are a, a local service provider, like a, like a therapist or real estate agent or financial planner or insurance broker, this is a strategy that you can use to succeed in this new coming era. So when you have this, I mean, it sounds um, fail-proof, but I know that there are things that can go wrong. Mm. I'm curious. Um, so to me, it kind of feels like and seems like, all right, at, at the base level, you're going to perform better just by adding this, right? Um, so I don't see any way that this isn't going to help someone. But what are the mistakes that people make that maybe limit the potential of how good this can perform, how maybe even how quickly it performs? Yeah, you know, it's like anything in life, right? It's, um, it's not just doing the thing, it's the execution of the thing. Anybody can write a book, but writing a good book takes some skill, it takes some practice, it takes experience, and most importantly, it takes working with people who know what makes a good book. Now, one of the benefits of having a technology platform where we've had over 12,000 quiz funnels built we know empirically with data what works and what doesn't work. And what we found are a few things that I'll share here for anybody who's thinking about, all right, what might a quiz funnel look like for your business? So every quiz funnel follows the same process. And this is really mistake number one, following the wrong process. And the process is attract, diagnose, and prescribe. And the key when it comes to creating your quiz funnel is you have to start with the end in mind. This is not about creating a cute and creative quiz that you think people are gonna actually take. You wanna start with the end in mind, which is what do you want people to do as that next step after they take your quiz funnel? Is it to book an appointment with you online and get on the phone with you or your sales team? Is it to watch your webinar? Is it to join your group? Is it to buy your product right then and there? Is it to buy a copy of your book? What's that next step that you want people to take? You wanna start with the end in mind. So mistake number one is following that wrong process. Now, mistake number two, if we go to that three-part framework, attract, diagnose, and prescribe. Mistake number two is having what we call the wrong hook. Now, in marketing terms, the hook is the thing that attracts people in the first place. And when it comes to a successful quiz funnel, you could create a quiz funnel on virtually any topic under the sun. I mean, we have a retirement planning quiz funnel for one of our clients. We have a, a golf swing killers quiz funnel for one of our clients. Um, we have, uh, gosh, I mean, I could, you know, uh, uh, you know public speaker quiz funnel, um, tennis, leadership, um, art quiz funnels. What's the perfect painting for your home? Um, so there's so many possibilities, but when it comes to the type of quiz, the framework, as we describe it, there are only three to choose from. So Justin, I'll invite you to, to kind of do this in real time. And anyone listening to this, I'll invite you to do the same thing. As I explain each of these three types of quizzes, just think to yourself, which one do you think might make the most sense for your business? So first type of quiz one is what we call a type quiz. Now a type quiz is one where you're putting people into different categories or different types based on the answers to a few different questions. The psychology here, I warn you, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to psychology, is known as the psychology of categorical perception. Basically, that's just a fancy way of saying that our brain needs to put things into buckets in order to make sense. When we were kids, we learned the difference between a dog and a cat. So you have the dog bucket and you've got the cat bucket. We learned the difference between triangles and squares. Now, as adults, we operate much in the same way. Even when something exists on a spectrum, like take color, for example, color is a spectrum, it's an infinite spectrum, but our brain, in order to make sense, we have to organize things into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and so on and so forth. That's an artificial construct that our brains have made up. So when you tap into that, people have this need, not just for things, but for themselves. What bucket do I fall into? So you can have a type quiz. Like for example, Neil Gordon has a quiz. He was driving for Lyft before COVID happened. He heard about the power of a quiz funnel, had a passion for public speaking, decided to create a quiz. What type of public speaker are you? There are five types. Which one are you? On the back of this quiz, he's built a public speaking training business that makes six figures a month all on the back of the strategy. So that's a type quiz example. And that's in contrast to the second type of quiz, which is what's known as a killer quiz. Now, a killer quiz is different. A killer quiz is where you help people identify the single biggest mistake 
that they're making in their life or their business that's holding them back from achieving the transformation that your product or service helps give someone. So I'll give you an example of this. I think of Charlie Wallace. He was a, a struggling musician trying to make things work, traveling the world, trying to make it as a musician, needed to make extra money. So he started teaching guitar lessons and he started teaching guitar lessons online. And he found that people kept making the same mistakes over and over again with their technique. So he decided to create a quiz, a progress killers quiz. And I know Justin, you play the guitar. And what he found was that there are five major mistakes that people make in their technique. And by helping people identify the single biggest mistake they're making when it comes to playing the guitar, he can often help people unlock that next level of performance. And so he created this quiz, launched this brand, Guitar Mastery Method, Guitar Mastery Online. That business now makes over $2 million a year teaching people how to play guitar online, all on the back of a killer quiz. So that's the second type. Now, the third type, so we've got a type quiz, killer quiz, and the third and final type is what's known as a score quiz. Now, a score quiz is where you're helping people identify where they are on a spectrum of success. So, you know, in other words, you know, are they a beginner? Are they intermediate? Are they an expert? Are they a, a level one, a level two, a level three, based on whatever it is that you help people with in their life or their business? And the reason why this is so powerful, the psychology here, is what's known as social comparison theory. Now, Justin, you and I know that you shouldn't ever compare yourself to anybody else, um, but our brains are actually hardwired to do that. It's how we make sense of the world. So we're constantly asking ourselves questions like, how is it that he was able to make more money in his business than me? How is it that you know, she's more successful in her career than I am? We're constantly doing that. So when you tap into that social comparison need, people are incredibly compelled to find out what their score is in that area of their life. And an example of this would be, I think of Dev Basu. Dev Basu has a digital marketing agency in Canada called Powered by Search. He created a, what is your digital readiness score quiz? to help businesses who are offline figure out how ready they are to move their business from an offline paradigm to an online paradigm. So those are the three types, type, killer, score. And the first kind of micro assignment that I invite even you, Justin, to be thinking about and anyone listening to this or watching this right now to be thinking about is which one might make the most sense for you and your business? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I feel like all of them are great, but it really does depend what your business is. Um, you know, for me, I feel like it's probably a type quiz, but I could easily see a score quiz too. Mm. Um, you know, it's fascinating. I, I mean, some businesses might be able to use all three, but I, I have to imagine that there's a scenario where you make the wrong offer. Like you, you, you really have to like figure out what is the correct offer for your business and know the correct quiz to use, right? And that's the third big mistake that I'll talk about. Now, we don't have time to talk about all the mistakes, but you know, the wrong process is mistake number one. Mistake number two is the wrong hook. You gotta attract the right type of people. And then mistake number three is the wrong offer. Now, as we mentioned, you can virtually sell almost anything on the back of a quiz funnel. You can drive people to a high ticket offer, low ticket offer. It could be coaching, mastermind. It could be uh, to uh, solicit investors. If you're looking to raise money and you're looking to find out if someone is a good fit for the fund that you're looking to start, or if they're a good fit for the project that you're looking to um, maybe raise money for. So you can really use it to sell anything. So it's less about the offer itself, and it's more about the presentation, the articulation of the offer. And the big mistake that people make here is that they present the offer in the wrong way. The paradigm that you want to be thinking about is something that we call Band-Aid Cure, and it goes like this. So if you think about like your daughter, Justin, or one of our boys, if you think about when you know they're playing outside, if they get an injury and they hurt themselves, what do they do? They run inside and they say, mommy or daddy, I need a Band-Aid. Band right? Yeah, exactly, right? So that's what kiddos think they need. Now, you as the adult know that the Band-Aid is not going to make the injury feel any better. But what do you need to do? You need to oblige. You need to put the Band-Aid on. You've got to give your little one a hug. You got to let the tears you know, dry away. And then, and only then can you say, all right, honey, if we really want to make the pain go away, we're going to have to put some ice on it. But it's only after you've delivered the Band-Aid. Well, your market is the same way. Your market thinks they know what the solution might be. They have an idea of what that solution might be. So you, as the expert in your space, provide the band-aid, which is the free result, the free value you deliver after someone takes your quiz. That's the offer that you're giving people, the goodwill that you're pouring out. But when you do this well and you do this right, what ends up happening is people say, okay, great, so that's the band-aid, but what's the cure? How do I solve this for good? And that's when you can segue seamlessly into your paid product or service. 
So it's this Band-Aid cure paradigm, which is at the critical piece after someone takes the quiz funnel that leads people that paid product or service. So we've got the right process, the right hook, the right offer. You combine these things together and some more nuance and detail than we've got time to cover here in today's conversation. And you've got the makings of an incredibly powerful, incredibly successful engine that's going to drive the growth of your business for years and years to come. This is fascinating and I love it. And I'm excited about this next chapter for uh, you know, for, for the lifestyle investor brand and for, you know, I, I have several friends that have worked with you and, and friends that plan to work with you. And I'm excited about that. Uh, my big question is where can people find out more about you and about quiz funnels and about, you know, what, how, how to make this work in their business? Yeah, look, you know, I know in a medium like this, where we're having a conversation it opens up just so many questions. Like, for example, if you're, you're like me and you're a visual person, you might be saying, can we see some examples? Like, what does this actually look like? I want to like see what this looks like in businesses like mine. Um, well, if you're listening to this or watching this right now, your timing is perfect. And here's the reason why. Once a year, we do a week-long quiz funnel workshop where we go through the process of how to figure out what all of these elements are going to be for you and your business. We work together to figure out what is your topic going to be? What questions are you going to ask? What type of quiz is right for you? What should your offer be and how do you frame it? Along with seeing dozens of examples in all sorts of different markets and situations. Now, the ticket price to attend this workshop is normally $100 to attend. But because Justin is awesome and because he really wanted to acknowledge and reward all of his listeners... Um, he has set things up that he is going to pay for your admission. He has set up a special coupon code that you can use that's going to take your ticket price from $100 to be 100% free. And the way you do that is by going to a special link that we've set up that is quizfunnel.com forward slash lifestyle for lifestyle investor. And when you get to that page, enter the coupon code lifestyle, all one word. So once again, it's quizfunnel.com forward slash lifestyle, enter the coupon code lifestyle, and your ticket price will be 100% free. The only catch is that we only do this once a year. It's done live, and it just so happens to be happening right here, right now. So your timing is absolutely perfect. And for anyone who's here, I'd love to welcome you with open arms and walk you through the process and hopefully set you up for success to build your very own high converting quiz funnel step-by-step -step in your business. Well, this is awesome. Thanks so much for, you know, welcoming our audience into your network and your arena where you specialize. Uh, and so I'm just thrilled, uh, again, how, you know, our paths keep intersecting and how there's so much opportunity for, you know, people in, you know, both of our audiences to be able to gain value back and forth from each other. So uh, thanks for sharing this. Thanks for spending the time today. This was just an awesome session. Uh, any last words of wisdom you want to share before we sign off? One of the things one of my mentors once told me that's always stuck with me, and it's something I share all of our with all of our students and clients is, look, um, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. But the best time to get it going is right here, right now, today. So ask yourself, what's that next step you can take that's so small, it's impossible to fail and take that first step? Well, I love it because I end every episode with almost the same thing that I share, uh, which is this, what's the one step you can take today towards financial freedom, towards a life by design, not by default, a life on your terms, not someone else's. And so I love that your mentor shared that with, with you. I feel like I've had mentors that have shared that with me. And I do think that's it. It's finding one move, one step, one action item, and then just consistently doing that, getting better than you were yesterday. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Ryan. And uh, I'm excited to build the quiz final with you. And for everyone in, in my audience, or my community that uh, also is, is willing to take this challenge and jump on board. Love it.